Lions Rock Productions. This is Jay Moore. This is Greg Cruz. This is Bryce Vine. This is Dexter from The Offspring. This is Nathan This is Sebastian Younger. This is Daryl This is Stuart Copeland. This is Mick Gillette. This is Andy Summers. This is Dr. Bob Greenberg. This is Gabby Reese. This is Rob Bell. Hey, this is John Leon Guerrero. Hey, and this is Pete A. Turner. Hi, this is John Spencer from the Modern War Institute at West Point, and I'm on the Break It Down Show. And now, the Break It Down Show with John Leon Guerrero and Pete A. Turner. Yes, you are. And t- sitting right seat with me today, my guest co-host and a friend of mine from, gosh, it's getting to be a long time now, but a fellow combat warrior, a fellow ground truth guy just like me. He's been on a previous episode with myself and Dr. Rich. His name is Will Hardy. Will, thank you so much for being on the show. Thanks for having me. Will has uh, written a bunch of articles on his own. He's partnered with Rich and I on a couple of things, and we always collaborate, so he certainly has the chops to uh, be in this discussion. And, of course, John works for <laughs> works for West Point's Modern War Institute, so he clearly has the chops. If you're interested about his writing, you can go to their website. He is He's on there, and you can see, but he is a retired major, just recently retired. His wife took him out to Cal- Colorado for her next assignment, so he works remotely, so you've got better weather out there john and uh, for anybody who wants to it's mwi.usma.edu if that's too complicated at p day turner and i will get you a link to him and actually john tweets quite a bit too so if it's easier just to reach out to him directly at spencer guard just how you would normally spell that uh, or at war institute both of those areas are places where you can go to read some of the fascinating things that he has has written it's really neat to be able to do this guys because uh and i guess guys i mean the guys i'm talking to but also the audience we look modern war is hard it's hard to know what's coming every time you read a paper they write about p- people that have prussians from 200 years ago and they write about world war ii as we try to get a handle on what the heck is coming next and i know will and i talk about talk about it and i know all three of us talk about the training but at some point there's just no more room for more training so we have to evolve training or you know we're always compromising something and and these conversations help us all figure that out so this is definitely a advanced combat conversation but i think the audience will dig it because you can't get this kind of stuff Stuff anywhere else so with that said um will thank you for coming on john thank you for coming on john where do you let's just let you, let you hit the ball let's uh let's go from go from here where do you want to go first we got the whole urban conflict thing that you're an expert on and will and i have i, I hate to even try to put a number on but a lot of time outside the camp on patrols in in the urban environment so where do we go uh, one of the places i like to start is just um, questioning whether we we prepare ourselves for that environment. Um, I'm a you know former infantryman that fought in an urban environment. You thrust me in there, and I can talk about the tactics of it, um, how we prepare ourselves, um, all the way up to the strategic. And do we just plainly still try to avoid cities at our own you know downfall in, in every aspect? Um, wh- where do you want to start? I mean, I like to start with you can run from the urban all you want in the military. But it is the future. The, the world is going urban in every aspect of whether it's economic, political, where are the insurgents, where are the bad guys, where, I mean, you name it. And it's going to be an urban environment. Let me ask you this then. This is, brings up a good a point because there we are dealing with this insurgency problem and there's people that are pro counterinsurgency and they're, you know, they're contra counterinsurgency. And I know where, where I sit is, is that we're sort of missing what the fight is. And quite often my experience from talking to the locals on the ground is, is our problem is not us winning hearts and minds. It's transferring that trust to the look from the local populace to the local government. And it's not important if we win hearts and minds, it's important if they do. So in effect, what we are a lot of times is we're the insurgents because there's an established government there. It may not be anything that we recognize, but we end up spending a lot of time trying to fight something that we ultimately end up creating ourselves. Will, John, what are your guys' thoughts on that? I think you're exactly right on that, Pete. There's a trend where if everybody – so I live within the the trade-off world, unfortunately – Um, these days. And there's a trend that if we're going to discuss the urban environment, which typically we uh, just say we're going to avoid the urban environment, 
But if we're going to discuss the urban environment, we're going to discuss the ideal where it's, it's a, a, a grunts playground with zero population and it's literally just military operations and urban terrain. And this is where you knock a wall down. This is how you do an ambush. Everybody's just living in a playground. But the reality is we are never going to have a situation where the population doesn't play a role within urban environments. Even in Fallujah and uh, Phantom Fury and Al-Fajr, the population, we dropped leaflets. We told them, get out. If you're still here, you're going to die. There was still a significant population within those cities, or within Fallujah when those operations kicked off. Um, so just the reality of it is it's, it, it's a messy, it's going to be messy. And the primary, er, maybe not the primary, I guess that uh, isn't quite accurate, but a major part of urban operations will always be the population and they have a say in what goes on. John, yeah, you've been an infantry commander, uh, a company commander. You you were out in these towns fighting these fights. You're a ranger for crying out loud. So you know the hard part of the fight and what Will is talking about. How do how do we take 11 Bravos Marines and get those guys to be multifaceted enough to do this kind of thing when, when we already struggle to get enough training in the shoot, move and shoot, move and communicate aspects. Yeah. Let me circle back to what you're saying. I think you hit the nail on the head on the counterinsurgency insurgency and whether we understand these deep urban environments or not. And whether, you know, what are we trying to, you know, are we trying to stand up a government in our own Western eyes or, you know, get the, the area back to stab- stability. When I, you know, in Baghdad and the fight for Slider City, we restored um, security by using gangs. And you can call them what you want. They're gangs. They call them Sons of Iraq and Anbar, but in my Baghdad areas, they were literally like mafia leaders who could put people on checkpoints with guns and that could secure the area because, you know, us 11 Bravos, we're never going to do it. We're never going to understand the social, political, cultural aspects of that neighborhood, um, let alone be able to cover that this the magnitude of you know seventy five thousand people in the three little block you know areas that I controlled. Um, we controlled the area with gangs. Without that understanding of how how it all works in that environment, you're never going to be successful, and you're definitely never going to get to a political outcome. Back to the grunts, I, I'd love to go down that that rabbit hole of. Um, we have a cultural aspects of the way we prepare ourselves for, you know, enter and clear a room, knock down a wall, all those things that are just like we'll hit on the head that are absent of people. Every training site on every base is, you know, it's, you know, three to 20 buildings um, with wide open roads and, and you learn how to attack into that building and, and into the room um, without the reality of what we've been fighting in the 15, last 15 years. Yeah, I've seen Will in training uh, donkey kick a door open. And, oh, yeah. and our job at that time, this is the best part, our job was <laughs> to go out and ask questions and have nothing to do with combat. But that was part of our prep. And it's, I'll, I'll say this, and I won't put Will on the spot. The training we received was all fantastic military training. 95% of it had nothing to do with what we were going to do on the battlefield and that remains true even if you're a tanker you know death before dismount except for we're always dismounted so we've we've got a problem of transitioning these things and like you said you can bring stability uh dr rich and i wrote a whole paper on transition operations how do we hand that trend that stability over you know I've, i've seen a lot of units box up and leave out of baghdad and out of Mosul and all these other areas and their partners in our, on the Iraqi side, literally had no idea we were for reals leaving. They knew that day was coming, but yeah. I would go in and I'd say, no shit, 100 days or less. And they're like, oh, my God, I'm going to die. What are you doing? And they're, so they're really, for them, the shock was incredible. And now think about the civil populace. So h- how do we get a bunch of rangers who have to deal with this? Uh, and I don't know where Will is on this, but I, I know we're kind of similar the elements to a modern fight, for sure, military, and let's talk about that. But then how do we also get rangers and infantry guys to deal with the social, cultural, political, religious aspects of fights? Uh, Will, you want to take that? I mean, I can start <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah, you go ahead and start off since I'm yeah. playing the uh, the, the co-host role. And yeah, all so for, the, for the rangers, uh, you know, rangers are, you know, if you're talking to ranger regiment, that's a – 
it's a, a kinetic, the baddest fighting organization in the world um, with a sole purpose to destroy things, break things, kill people. They don't have a counterinsurgency mission. If you're talking the general purpose force, you know, ranger qualified individuals, you know, 101st, 10th Mountain, 82nd, you're going to put on the ground and you're going to tell them, hey, take this piece of ground and we're going to draw some lines on a map and you own it and bring back stability. And I think that's where you get into that. How do you prepare them to understand that environment to where they can start having effects, let alone the, the nine month to 12 month turnover that you just talked about, which I've written about as well on, you know, we just basically hit delete, reset. Um, <laughs> Vietnam era, we're fighting you know a fifteen year war one year at a time, but the simple fact is that we don't understand urban environments because we refuse to specialize in it, and we refuse to train specifically for it. Yeah, and I'll echo that, and I'll go even further. We don't understand operational environments very well. Uh, the Army and the Marine Corps. Um, so I'm a I'm a Marine, and I, now I work for the Army, but I always. Uh, and I try to be careful and mention both whenever I'm going to be a pessimist. But yeah. right now, the military uses Hamisi as the, the go-to, which Hamisi, uh, political, military, economic, social, information, and environment, information, infrastructure, physical. Let's just, in the audience isn't going to know what Hamisi is. Let's just cover this real quick. So for the audience's sake, PMISI is an acronym that gives you a guideline on how to assess an area. When, when Bill says understanding your operational environment, what what do you have? What are you working with? So that's what PMISI is. And it's, yeah, it, there's a number of acronyms that they use to evaluate a region. But but what he's saying is PMISI is the common one. So go ahead and go from there, Will. PMISI is not an analytic tool. It, it doesn't do analysis in and of itself. It's a categorization and a taxonomic tool, meaning it gives you categories and it uh, can give you questions to ask to populate those categories. But it doesn't give you, it doesn't do analysis for you. The current form of PMISI, and I'm, I'm at, uh, at my work uh, within Trade G2, we are trying to tackle PMISI and we're having to fight against the people who love PMISI because it's what they've known. But PMISI is, it's basically Wizard of Oz. There is a man behind a curtain. You populate your chart and then magic happens behind the curtain and you come out with your answer. And whatever that answer may be, if you give that same information to somebody else, they may come up with a totally different answer because it's not a repeatable systematic process that has for lack of a better term, checks and balances. And how often, when someone does PMISI, how often is is a local leader consulted on what the uh, what their assessment is of the area? From I, I won't uh, generalize across the military, but from my experience, PMISI is uh, part of the IPB process. So your uh, your two will tell the uh, two chief that hey, we need to do PMISI, and the two chief will tell an analyst to do PMISI, and the <laughs> analyst will jump on their computer and populate an Excel spreadsheet, and that's PMISI. And then whenever somebody engages with the, uh, the operational environment and they notice, like, hey, the sky's light blue today, not blue, and PMISI told me it would always be royal blue, then they, they revisit it. But it's, it's starting – it basically starts you off with a baseline that is completely inaccurate and not systematic. And you got me off on a tangent on PMISI, but uh, – yeah, r- right now we we don't understand the operational environment very well. It does go to that whole thing, and and we're not held accountable to an actual local reality. Again, going back to the ground truth, so we based our tactics off of things and our preparation off of these things. So here we have this impossible fight that John's talking about, where we've got to go out and do this grisly door to door urban fight. And then we know, I don't know, John, what would you say? Do we know 10% of the environment if we're focused on a threat-based uh, plan? Or what would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, I think I think you, we get pretty good at targeting. Okay. Um, so I give you that. That's the 10% of the targeting that we get pretty good at. I'll, you know, understanding the you know, everything else in the environment um, that will bring stability to it. Because, you know, there's not just – what is a bad guy? You know, who do I target? It's, it's the whole environment. Like it's almost like an ecosystem or I use the body analogy. You touch it and it's going to change. We don't understand it. So we're literally, I mean, just like cavemen stomping through these environments looking for bad guys to, to hammer. 
I, I use a real good analogy of using concrete walls. I don't know if you caught that, but how we use concrete walls to control urban environments in, in, in Iraq. And it was very effective. And we even won a battle, a major battle by just surrounding them in walls in a siege warfare tech. But without understanding the environment, what, what we basically did was we re socially, economically, everything organized a city because you cut every main line that naturally occurs in that environment. Um, so as a, you know, as a ground truth guy, I'm like walls work. I put a wall up. <laughs> yeah. You can't get nothing in there. You can't get nothing out, but now nobody can get to their market. Nobody can, you know, go talk to their brother that lives on the other side of the wall. Um, but we just threw down walls for you know, 10 years in Iraq because we didn't understand how the environment worked, nor did we care because we do right. think a lot of times that we can shape the environment. Um, and there's just some, you know, some generals coming out lately you know, about this belief that you can shape the environment uh, ain't going to work in these urban environments. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about shaping the population perceptions and, and in a variety of different ways, and it's not done through backpacks and it's not done through psyop. And I, and look, I love I love my psyop brothers and sisters, but look, they're net destabilizers, and so is civil affairs. And turns out, so is the infantry. When we're trying to get stability out of an area that sticks, you know. It's really hard. I, I hope to someday go back to the areas in Iraq where I had been to and studied because I would imagine that the buildings, if they're still standing, don't house Iraqi police or Afghan army people. Uh, it's This stuff's really, really tough. I wanted to ask you, John, about in the urban fight, we're trying to improve what what it means to be an infantry person on, on a patrol to, to do these things. And Will and I are saying, Hey, there's a lot more going on. So do we have to have, um, I, I guess these, you know, we already have enablers that come on missions that try to do other missions, but at some point you've got so much kinetic killing conflict going on. It's really hard for Will or myself to, to be effective when there's, it's like shooting and interviewing at the same time. <laughs> It's really tough to pull that off. How do we, I don't, what do we do about that? We still have to do the work. Like I still need to talk to people and your infantry guys still have to go out and, and find clothes with and destroy the enemy. Yeah. I mean, the excuse I usually get is the prioritization. So the, you know, an infantryman's priority is the, the most highest risk one, which is to close with and destroy the enemy. But all the other things are lesser things. So what you're talking about, those are all lesser things. So I don't need to prepare them for that. I mean, my one recommendation, and it, it kind of goes back to permission, but just adding the variable of power, I would have done things differently if I had just sat down for a good amount of time and said, okay, how does power work in this area? And I don't mean legitimate power. I mean, ground truth. Yeah. Who runs this place? How does money flow? And I did a little bit of that. And I did some, some things bosses probably wouldn't be happy with. Don't tell anybody. Giving, yeah. Yeah. Giving people weapons, getting, you know, making things happen, which is the way the, the world actually works. Um, but analyzing power would be a huge asset um, if we had some type of framework that helped people understand how power worked in a, you know, even the subset of where you are at, let alone how does it connect to the, the, the person that, that's a really good thing that we do in the, in the army too, is draw lines. And I, I'm, I'm up front as a ground truth guy. I did not care if something blew up or happened on the other side of that street, which is <laughs> in my area. Uh, so I was literally, you know, how do I understand my little part of the pie? If I don't understand how it connects to the other one, that's not my problem. I'm trying to keep things from going bad in my assigned area, which is, sure. you know, it's our da- one of our downfalls. What do you think, Will? I've got a, a story, if you don't mind me going into it, that kind of covers a lot of this. And it, it's it's a real story, but it's got moments of the absurd where you just want to slap your forehead. So I, I can go into it if you want. Yeah, let's do it. Um, this is back in late 2011 down in southwest Afghanistan, kind of where Helmand and Nimroz provinces meet along the ring road. It's working with the the Marine RCT as a human terrain member. So the way the the Marine regiments were divided was uh, one Marine regiment had Northern Helmand and Nimroz, and the other Marine regiment had Southern Helmand. At that time, Marja was kicking off, and uh, the Southern Marine regiment was just loving life, getting to blow things up, getting to kill people. And the Northern Marine regiment, who I was supporting, was frustrated. So uh, every day in a targeting meeting, the, the guys in the South would be putting up 15, 20 guys and getting approved to, you know, do whatever good things they wanted to do to them. And the guys in the North would put up one guy and say, we don't know much about him. 
And it, they, their targeting officer was just getting increasingly frustrated as his deployment went on. Like he was three or four months in and he hadn't dropped a single JDAM. So like he would walk around being like, I got to drop a JDAM. I don't, don't care who I drop it on. I got to drop one. <laughs> and so they, they started to recognize a theme, which John, I'm sure you've experienced this, Pete. I know you've experienced where whenever insurgent attacks would happen, cell phone towers would cut off and all of a sudden communications would just not be working the the two shop did its thing and they realized that there was this guy uh i like to call him agajan when i uh use this scenario or this vignette in classes that i teach because agajan doesn't mean anything it's like mr man but this guy owned the property that the two major cell towers within this um this afghan urban area so not really an urban area but afghan urban area so they said he is the he is the link between the towers and the insurgents. He needs to go. He's got to be high up. So they prepped a uh, targeting package and got ready to send it up. And as the lowly human train guy, I said, "Hold on, guys. Let me at least you know do my thing because if this guy is a property owner out here, you never know w- what's going to go on. He he may be somebody important. I had a good relationship with three. And he was like, all right, you got, you got a little bit of time, go do your thing. So I, I went out and started interviewing people in the local bazaar, started talking to uh, members of the local government and actually sat down and talked to Agajan himself. And uh, I, I can tell you that my interpreter and I both thought he was the biggest dick in the world. We hated him. <laughs> but uh, just because we didn't like his attitude and anything like that didn't mean he needed to die. We probably talked to 20 or 30 people in the bazaar before we actually talked to him. And then we went back out into the bazaar and got a couple of patrols and just talked to as many people as we could just to see what they would say. And we found out that uh, Agajan owned an ice factory. And so this was the only ice factory within the town. And then talking to Agajan, we found out that he was the primary ice provider to the local populace, which... Okay, so cool. You provide ice. We might piss people off if we uh, schwack you and they can't get ice, mainly because we're right next to uh, the Dashti Margo Desert, uh, the Desert of Death. But then we find out he also has the ISAF contract for the local base. So we're going to be schwacking the guy who has the ISAF contract to provide ice to Americans. So now there's starting to be a little bit of a gray area because we are implying that hey sign a contract with americans we'll kill you so it it starts to get fuzzy then we um find out he owns a construction company and he's privately funded all sorts of projects within the urban area so he's done bizarre improvements he's uh redone the sewer system in the bazaar so that open ditch where all the garbage gets brushed and then someone comes by and picks up all the garbage he completely redid those out of his own pocket and then he, uh, he funded the garbage removal because he realized, hey, we've got this great system, but nobody's removing it. So I'm going to do that. So now we're starting to realize that this guy's a little bit more important than uh, we were giving him credit for. And it, it gets so much worse. So afterwards, <laughs> we talked to people on the district sheriff council. We actually see him leaving the district sheriff council. And we're like, wait, what is this guy doing here? So we start talking to people and they say, oh, he's trying to join the district sheriff council. And we're like, oh, so this guy that we're pretty sure is the enemy uh, and we're about to kill is trying to join the district sheriff council. Who does he say he represents? Why does he want to be part of the district sheriff council? Talk to him again and talk to more people and find out that he's not from the local area. He's a transplant from central Afghanistan and he uses his power and influence to connect other internally displaced peoples to the local government so right there that that sends off a red flag in my mind so i go back out i I convince the unit to give me another patrol in the bazaar and i start asking people um where can i find internally displaced people who can i talk to and i i find some and i start saying how do you connect to the local government and some of them just say they they could care less about connecting they realize they're on tough times they don't want to make it any tougher but others say oh we go to agajan and he represents us um in the uh he represents our needs and our concerns to the local government and so i go back to the the district sheriff council and i start asking what would you estimate your uh the idp population is in this region in this uh district 
And they say it's like 15 to 20 percent of the entire population. So now we find out that this one guy is the local uh, unofficial representative of roughly 15 to 20 percent of the population that we were going to kill. So I, I get all this information and I go back and I brief uh, the three and the two at the, the regiment and they'd say, OK, we better not kill him. Uh, let's let's pull off. And they don't do it. And then like a week later, we find out that he has become an official member of Droa and uh, he's been approved by Kabul and all that. So we were we were inches away from killing a Droa official because we we drew a line between towers and insurgents without what? trying to understand anything else. Let me j- ask you this real quick question. And you threw a lot of things out there. So just for the listeners, Droa is the government of Afghanistan. And sure as are our meetings, our councils, don't, you don't have to worry too much about that. Uh, also, he talked about uh, just basically you're talking about someone who's working outside the traditional system, but working on his way in. For you to go find that stuff out, what level of degree of, of experience do you need to do that? Like that that task, that's not a that's not an infantryman's task. That sounds pretty specialized. How many people that you've come across doing the kind of work that we do could handle that specific kind of work? To have the influence with the command, to be able to get the operations and the intel people and the commander to all listen and not, not kill this guy. How challenging is that job? It, I would say it's it's a one in a million task. And the only reason I was able to even throw a flag in the air and say, hold up, let's not kill this guy right right away is because I had a previous relationship with the three where I had been his two chief in uniform prior to me being within the human train system. So he had a, an already built trust with me. Um, but for for an outsider to do it, very unlikely take it would take a lot of time and probably take a unit's entire rotation to build that trust up um and for an insider it it would take a unique personality within the military who's a non-conformist who is willing to think outside of the box to uh say hey everybody i know we're hammers but let's not hit this nail quite yet and i I know i'm a pessimist but uh (laughs) I, i think it would be unusual for uh the military unless it changes what it's currently doing for training and education and development to uh develop someone who uh is surrounded by hammers but is unwilling to be a hammer the first chance he gets john that will just went on for a long time with a really important mm-hmm. lesson but what are your thoughts i mean it's easy to say I knew something that you guys didn't know and it changed the war. But the reality is, is this stuff's really hard. It's there's a thousand of those lessons. What are your thoughts? Yeah. Well, one is, I mean, I've definitely, all of us can have those type of stories and feel that type of, um, you know, you know, mistakes made. Okay. We actually made the mistakes or the mistakes close to being made. Um, and you, you get that aha moment that kind of saves you. You know, what scares me is they're trying to do that at magnitude in um, one of these, what I call dense urban environments, which yeah. it just means a whole lot of people. That blows my mind. And, you know, I, I'm a pessimist as well as as I see us, but there is light. I mean, the, the U.S. military, if it, it can be called anything, are the masters of making stuff up. This episode of the Break It Down Show is brought to you by Lions Rock Productions. That's us. We publish, evaluate, and develop podcasts just like this one, consult others to build their own, and create associated content and content marketing strategies. So if you're launching or expanding your social media presence, your business, or your personal brand, or if you just want to take your media presence to the next level, reach out to us on Twitter at Pete A. Turner or at John LG69 at the Break It Down Show. There's a thousand ways to get a hold of us. Now enjoy the show. I mean, the, the U.S. military, if it, it can be called anything, are the masters of making stuff up. We are expected to adapt to whatever you get thrown into. And you train and you design your forces to get you know, as general as possible, but they're actually designed for a very specific enemy in a very specific location, which ain't urban and it ain't insurgencies. We want them to adapt. And, and we did that. And you saw that for 15 years. You know, I get frustrated as a pessimist, though, and saying if we would have just given them a little bit more information to help them adapt. You know, we developed 
um, just because of the magnitude of those type of situations, the magnitude of information that you get in a in a city, or you know, even the little neighborhood I had, that, like I said, it has seventy five thousand people. You, your intelligence shop just can't handle the information, and that's where you get this overload of information. So we developed, and actually, my partner in crime at the Modern Wars too, uh, John Amble, is an editor. He's actually a military intelligence officer too, so I get to poke at him a little bit. Yeah, and see that we were doing intelligence at the company level, which we weren't. Um, but we developed what we call company intelligence support teams, which is really just I put more people in my headquarters um, back on the base looking at these type of things, trying to identify patterns, you know, running profiles on people that the the higher headquarters just can't do just by the the magnitude of, and that's my fear is that. You know, as we reset and we focus on the the enemy or the environment we that we think we're going to, we're discarding all those lessons that we learned, especially for the urban, because we refuse to specialize in urban. And that's where I get, and, you know, some I've studied urban now for the last four years for you know dedicated academic study. Right. And the more I learn, the you know, the little bit more upset I get, as you know, <laughs> the stuff I've learned now, even from like let's say studying you know, Grozny, Stalingrad, all these, you know, how they figured out how to fight the fight could have helped me as a company commander infantry um, doing attacks that I was doing. And I'm like, oh man, I wish I would have known that where I was literally just making stuff up as I, I went along. Yeah. So we, we do have a problem where our doctrine is set on an old style of fighting. Um, we do have to figure out what those new things are, but, but we also don't get to predict them very well. And the urban fight is hard. I mean, how do you move place to place, care for people that need care? Because our military is asked to, asked to provide, you know, help to displaced people, to injured people, and all these, you know, impossible tasks all at the same time. What, what training would you want to see commanders get? I mean, one of the things that I've got to do, John, when I show up, right, is I've got to go find the battalion commander and say, basically – you don't know what I do, but I need to go on patrols. The more patrols you can put me on, the more successful I'll be. You don't, you won't get what I do. You'll put me under a captain, but within three weeks you'll see it and you'll get it. And within three months I'll be invaluable to you and I'll have open access and basically be your direct advisor. And I can say that to them because I've done it with enough commanders in a row that they, they appreciate it. But what do we do with the, you know, when I show up to see that captain in, in the company, if I don't have that wrap already built, how am I going to help you as you're trying to plan combat missions, put your people in the most lethal situations possible and extract them all safely? I mean, how do you have, how do you have the bandwidth to take on, like what training creates that kind of tolerance for, for Wills and Mize nonsense when we show up and we're like, hey, everybody, stop killing everybody, you know, because, there's a, a pivot there, right? We're like, we can't just have kinetic lethal operations. We have to, at some point, slide over. And it's really hard for someone who's taught to close with and, and destroy the enemy to say, now I'm going to do less of that starting now. Yeah, so I mean, it's definitely a hard problem that the Army has tried to look at. I mean, what you're, one of the things you're hitting at is just, you know, how do you measure openness to receive advice? Um, and, and, and the TH, you know, all these programs, even the, you know, the army strategist program, which is, you know, created a strategist to advise, um, commanders on strategy, which some of these things you think are inherent in individuals. So do you train and educate an individual to be able to, to do these things, or do you select and identify people that have the openness to receive advice on areas that special, you know, people that have specialties in other areas, um, is it, it's a great topic that the army struggles with. Um, you know, we're increasing now that we're in reset, we're increasing everybody's training time and everybody's education time um, as a way to address it as really you know, a lot of the stuff that we point to goes back to like the surge moments when, you know, nobody could fail anything and you know, just get everybody out and just rotate everybody. I have some very specific ideas on how you would prepare better, um, whether it's training, education, you know, the, the frameworks in which you look at it, urban and the army is uh, in, in their credit doing a lot right now. And I think, you know, Mosul kind of helped the, you know, the battles of Mosul, the battle of Raqqa, all that saying, Hey, you know, this may be the future and we need to change some stuff if it is um, because we don't train people. But, but to your specific question is how do you put a commander in so much complexity yeah. that he realizes that he doesn't know what he needs to know. 
and it's anti-cultural to, to think that it's a, you know it's a power symbol it's a, you know, and there's some that get it you know some of the greats that we can all point to that understand the value of reading the value of advice and, and how to make those decisions based on advice versus hey this is the way it's going to be and this is the way to do it so how do you throw so much complexity at somebody in training exercises that he has to accept advice that's one of the ways. Have you seen that level of training? I mean, when you've gone through, and, and I'm sure you've designed training, have you been able to witness training that's so complex? I mean, because I'd rather be pushed really hard in training, but that's what I've always done. Like when I, when I was doing counterintelligence training, I'm, I'm like, how can I push this person to fail so they can learn from failure here while it's safe and we're in Tombstone, not in Missoula? But have you seen that level of rigor in general? I mean, in multifaceted, right? Not just... Yeah, yeah, I know you can do a bounding overwatch successfully, but, but that's a simple task. Let's get to these complex tasks. I have not, although I was, when I went back to the National Training Center after serving in combat, I was pleasantly surprised at the complexity of the scenarios at these major training centers. But, you know, a unit might go to one of those once, once a, a year before his rotation and the Army's trying to increase those. I think a lot of it has to reside in education. And I know that mm-hmm. Rule has a lot, probably a lot of thoughts on this, on you know, how much can you st- stick into a bag of a, a year course, um, as there's even been some recent news, how they're dropping a history course. Where, I don't know if that's true or not. Right. And see, I go back, I, I have a saying, I say, out of the woods. From the day that we start in the Army, we put you into the woods. And I can tell you every type of, everything you need to know about surviving, adapting, shoot, move, and communicate in woods. Yeah. Tell you. You're not to wipe your butt with this type of leaf, stand behind this tree. Um, but we don't do any of that for urban. And that includes in our education systems. There, there's no urban block of instruction at, at these schools. There might be a single scenario or an elective you can take. What are your thoughts on that, Will? Yeah, I, I think John hit it on the head when he uh, mentions that it, it comes down to training and education. So from my perspective, as limited as it may be, the Army doctrine has to reflect systematic processes that can be enabled as starting points for um, people to be able to be familiar. So uh, five dot ADP Army doctrinal publication 5.0 on the uh, operations process. It can't just be a, a big magic wand when it says understanding an OE. It needs to go through a, uh, a process for familiarization. And then the training and education has to support that process and expand. John mentioned something that uh, it all comes down to familiarization. So Pete, uh, a minute ago, you mentioned how do you prepare that commander to be comfortable and be willing to trust this oddball enabler that just showed up when you're actually in combat. And if, if Will ruled the world, I would be putting those oddball enablers into the uh, workup process. That way the commander is aware of who they are, aware of what they do, and aware of, of what they can do. But that, to me, that's not enough. It then comes back to the training development and scenario development, where the Army has to make the training ro- and the scenario development robust enough that these enablers show their worth in the pre-deployment phase. Otherwise, you're just breaking down trust. And the commander may realize that, hey, Pete was with me in training, and all he did was eat ice cream he didn't do anything but eat ice cream and that's not necessarily pete's fault that's that's the training scenario and the scenario developers fault because they didn't give pete something to look at for the unit i I don't think there's a single solution the army's got to approach it holistically if they're going to be giving commanders more enablers then they have to be willing to familiarize and train the commanders to use those enablers and then the training and scenarios have to actually engage those enablers. And if, if one part of that puzzle is missing, the whole thing falls apart. One of the things I've been able to do because I've been in the field for so long is I've had units rotate over the top of me. I stayed in the area. I maintained my network of people that I had met and had my, my operational environment knowledge down pretty well. And 
I would see what would come out of national training centers and the units would come with this lethal focus, even though we all know that we stay long enough to start to become effective and then we leave, we, we should ought to have a better handoff. I never saw a unit ever do a good handoff. And, and I got good at the pace of when I could start to insert myself into the decision making cycle, but it always took six weeks, eight weeks before I could even begin to be part of what that unit was doing. And by then they had their battle plan and it took a long time to get the, the bow of the ship turned to where they were headed in, in a more, in a more productive direction. And that didn't always mean not doing lethal things. Cause like John is saying, like, this is a really complex and hard job just on the lethal part of it. And, and I totally agree that the specific skills required to survive and be effective in that environment, you have to train the heck out of those things. And it's not about being in a forest in a line waiting for Russians or Germans. It's, it's a different thing. But um, my, my critique of the NTCs is these guys all come out with these lethal focuses and they're fighting something that doesn't exist, especially like the Taliban or even even Al Qaeda towards the end. Instead of fighting the uncertainty of the population, they're fighting uh, an enemy that isn't going to show up. Even even if they exist, they're not going to get into a, a, an exchange that that is worthwhile in a lot of cases. So what ends up happening is is they've got this campaign plan that's obsolete before they even arrive in theater, and it seems like. It seems like we spend a lot of time, John, working on things. And I think we all agree on this, working on things that have very little bearing on our ability to adapt to what we're going to find out. I mean, tankers going to NTC in tanks and firing tables is great, but we all know that they're not going to be doing that. Doctrinally, great, but practically, ground truth says otherwise. What... I know you favor having like an urban warfare school and soon it's one of the things you've written about, but what, what do we do to change that thing? Like, you know, we have to train commander's ethos, right? We're going to train hard. We're going to be prepared for the battle that gets there. But when you get there, if the battle is 40%, 10% of what you've trained for, and, and it's just not there, even if it is a hard urban fight, it's a short duration thing. Maybe it's nine months of a deployment, but most likely most deployments and it ends up being a much shorter, more dynamic fight where it starts and it's over really fast. What what do we need to do to balance that out and get better at urban operations? One thing is I actually am on the doctrine. You know, I feel bad for the you know, doctrine riders at Fort Leavenworth that are, you know you get hit <laughs> up all the time on you know you need to improve urban doctrine. And I I, I don't agree. Um, although I don't like the fact that we. We in the army have this limits to our page limits of our doctrine because we think that, that that's all that people will want to read. So we put like a 250 page limit right. on our urban doctrine because you know some general back in the day thought that that would help people read more doctrine because we don't read our own doctrine. Um, but doctrine just it, it is a starting point, like Will said, that feeds the training and education systems. Um, I could go off on on the doctrine on that we think that that will help you know improve our doctrine. Um, I, I do believe it's training, training and education. But to your specific question, I, we have a knowledge management problem, and we've been talking all around it. And you know, the rotation of people, we just and I wrote something for the Washington Post. It did real well about how we hit delete in every rotation, and yeah. you know, it's anti-cultural to talk to. You know, of course, when the, the, the guy leaves, we're going to do everything better than he did. Um, but we had this immense cultural knowledge management problem where. Everything that is learned, there's no way to transfer that to the next guy, and it's almost culturally like biased to. I don't need your you know information. Right. I'm moving on. So we have to address this knowledge management gap, and urban you know just magnifies it on understanding the OE, but it goes to everything about how do we manage knowledge. I mean, how do we transfer that information that's learned? And I think the other thing you talked about is like even as a company commander myself and most people don't realize and i've gotten in trouble for saying this that we're all on the job training yeah we're all making it up um we've been through some training and education which isn't meant to prepare us for that job it's just meant to prepare us to be professionals and to you know education to, to know what to think not you know how to think not what to think if we could make a change overnight that i didn't learn about the operating environment until I was about nine months into my 12 month rotation. <laughs> where I started to get a few things. Right. I wasn't even comfortable in my job, 
where I could, you know, use the enablers like you're talking about to better do my mission and I'll keep my lethal focus to take down bad guys. I didn't understand enough about my job until I was into it for about nine months. And then, hey, look, I'm about to rotate out. And then, hey, I'm, I'm about to change my job. If I could make another change overnight, I would leave people in positions, all those positions longer, just like we do to non-commissioned officers. You're going to be a squad leader and a platoon sergeant for a long time. Yeah. And you are enablers to the leadership. You know, a, a platoon sergeant is an enabler to a platoon leader if he's open. And the platoon sergeant will try to make sure he is open if he's not. Um, it's a it's a micro, you know, micro picture of what we need to do for the entire army um, is how do we accept information that we know we need. Culturally, it's okay. You know, a brand new lieutenant knows he needs to listen to a platoon sergeant because he doesn't know anything. Yeah, and by the time you're a company commander, oh no, battalion commander, definitely not. Um, but you're only in those jobs for 12 months to two years. Yeah, It's just crazy. Other armies don't do it that way, but people say, you know, that's the power of our leader development process that we're all making it up. Uh, <laughs> you know, we're all on the job training. It's, it's a huge hurdle to get over. And then also you're not in command long and, and you're always, of course, when you're in support of the commander, you're beholden to, to their vision. And so if, if none of us know what we're doing, we're all working to make sure that that commander makes it up really well. And it, it becomes a real problem, especially when you rotate in and you go to Nimrose one year and the next year you're in Shinkei and then the next year you're in Kapisa province moving all around. And then you're like, never mind all that. Go to Kabul. Wait, wait, ne never mind. Go back to Kandahar, you know, and, and you can't develop a capacity to deal with the people that, you know, it's, I, I would think it's better to specialize in a province. And if you're in a hard place, then shit, man, that's tough. But what do you yeah, think? We could develop city watchers, you know, like Australians did for island watchers, develop city watchers to become city experts. Yeah. Yeah. As we went around the mega cities when I was on a research team, we found out that even country teams within mega cities don't understand how it works. Sure. Hell, the government in some of these places don't even understand how it works. In places like Dhaka and some really ugly places that we couldn't find ourselves, even if it's for humanitarian aid missions. Yeah. Um, they don't understand how it works. It just it just works. Yeah. And the other thing that I've noticed in terms of our doctrine, uh, and actually I've done, I've counted, I did a word count on the training and the basic level grenades and claymore manual on how to deploy a grenade or, or, or a claymore. And they're essentially an equal number of words for that. And that's like the just for the audience. That's the most basic level training. Like as you graduate basic, you learn how to how to fire a claymore. So this is talking basic basic training. And then I looked into the human, uh, the counter intel guide on how to use an interpreter. And there were the <laughs> same number of words for a higher level document. And and none of that training. And Will Will and I have talked a lot about this. But how in the world are we supposed to go out? And I'm going to throw a premise at you. I've talked to Will and I've talked to people that Will's worked with and that I've worked with. We all agree that we have more conversations on the battlefield than we fire rounds. Now, that's not always true, but predominantly over our career and everything else, that's what we've seen. Cause we've talked, there's in a company, there's dozens of conversations going on in a patrol with, with the, uh, with the locals. So given that, why aren't we better at least at interpreter operations? Why are we so reluctant to, use these people to their full power. Either one of you can comment on that. <laughs> I, I, I want to comment, but I'll, I'll give Will the floor if you want. Oh, it, because using an interpreter isn't sexy. It's sexier to be able to say, I, we put so many people through DLI, uh, the Defense Language Institute, and they are now proficient in Arabic, even though they may or may not be. And who knows if they can actually uh, speak Arabic and understand a situation and be cultural experts all while doing a combat patrol where they may be getting shot at. It, it's easier to get fund. It, it comes down to a funding issue. And this is my pessimism coming back out where it's easier to say, we're going to develop this capacity and we're going to be great. than it is to say, we are rec we recognize that we have a problem and this is a way that we can fix it, but it doesn't include making ourselves great. It includes allowing ourselves to trust someone else. But yeah, I'm a Debbie Downer on that issue. So, John? Uh, we could do an entire show on uh, language knowledge or you know, even the cultural language knowledge of an environment and whether we need to know that or not. 
um, the use of interpreters is just an, an aspect of that, um, how to mm -hmm. talk, communicate to the people. Um, I agree with Will, it, it, and I, I think about this a lot, it's, it's not the fight that we train or want for. A fight where we're going to have to talk to people. Yeah. And, and I jumped into Iraq in 2003, and I did not have an interpreter um, assigned until I found the guy on the street that was speaking English and saying, hey, you want a job? Holy shit. That, that was like three months into it. Um, it's not, if you look at the metal task or, you know, of what you design your units to do, we don't design them to talk to people. And there's some fights where you're never going to need one. Um, right. um, in my kind of star Wars put on my hat, I, like Will said, we were in these places for a long time, 10, 10 years, 15 years, 16 years. Um, but we never committed because it's not the fight we want to say, we're going to start educating people and develop language speakers I mean, even General Petraeus tied it, tried during the surge to require Army, Marine Corps, and the Navy to train people that are going to have contact with the population to have a zero or a plus or a zero or a one language proficiency in the area they're going to be in. And they got shot down because that was, he wanted that. But why haven't we developed a technology to where, let's say we're not fighting a counterinsurgency, but I still want to talk to the people yeah. that are going to be in my environment. I, you know, if you do a Ted talk called six Sense technology, if you watch the people at the UN, there's somebody there with a, you know, it doesn't have to be there. That's translating for them what's being said. We have, but we don't view it as a critical task to war fighting to be able to engage with people. It doesn't matter if it's kinetic or non-kinetic or counterinsurgency or not. It's just not, for some reason, culturally, something that we view as a critical task, so we don't invest in it. And that goes with the skill of how to use one if we need to. We are going to run out of time because <laughs> there's so <laughs> much to talk about. So so I don't know, Will, if you know, but uh, John wrote a great piece this last uh, December. And it's it's entitled Surgeon, A Soldier's Urban Warfare Christmas Wish List. Uh, I, I read it. Uh, I read it a while ago, and then I revisited it today as I was doing my homework to um, prep today. <laughs> what What stood out to you about his list? I can tell that John is an infantryman uh, based on his list, and uh, the Marine in me loved the list. Yeah, I absolutely want to be able. To, if I see a wall, I want to be able to take that wall down as quickly. I need to do it. I also I could kind of tell that the the article was written for a military audience. So it, it spoke to military. Uh, I mean, it's it's a Christmas list, um, which your Christmas list doesn't say I need eggs and bread on the table. Your Christmas list says I need the coolest shoes on this on the block. Um, so it, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I would love to write another article that kind of echoes it. But instead of being a Christmas list, being a, uh, a necessity list that uh, the army needs for the urban environment. And it would it would have everything we've we've covered today they need to be able to understand they need to be able to know how to utilize local interpreters and um they need to know how to be as uh as lethal as possible which means how to effectively apply lethality so that that also the flip the flip side is true when not to apply lethality yeah yeah but yeah the, the, the ability to discern the lethality thing is always going to be a problem. I, I loved it. it. Inspired me to write a little wish list too. Uh, but I like the, I loved the part about a credit card with an Amazon prime account. Cause you are right, man. <laughs> yeah. You yeah, just, right. there's so many times where you need something specific to, to make it happen. And if you could have that thing show up quickly, you, you could really change people's lives. And oftentimes it's the cheapest littlest thing that you're like, I just, I just need a few thousand dollars on hand to be able to deliver X. Like one of the stories I tell is, is uh, I got a lot of Intel broke through with a, a group of people because I was able to provide them with a box of sunscreen because they hadn't had sunscreen in a long time. And they're like, all right, this guy's all right. I mean, fucking sunscreen. We got a Connex a <laughs> shipping container overflowing with sunscreen. Like, yeah, I got that for days. What else do you need? And I started me asking the question, like, what is, what is this the dumbest, simplest thing? And you'll appreciate this, John, that we could do like right now today, like let's say let's do this and tomorrow it's done. And they would say, and this is 
common throughout Iraq, Afghanistan, the most common simple things, like all of that combat engineer power that we have, back bucket loaders, the ability to move tons and tons of concrete, that stuff proved fantastically valuable where people would right. say, if you could do this, if you could tamp down this part of the road where we're struggling to get our crop through, if you could move this one thing and create a gate and the IP could guard it, then we would have an opportunity to trust the IP and I'd let my kids go to school. And it's these simple things like that where it is something as simple as an Amazon Prime account that you can get these things done or look at your combat engineer power and say, I can move the earth. Why am I not using this to stabilize the area that I'm in? Yeah, so I, I, I – you, the the Amazon thing is a great point, and the army actually does have a system. And I had it as a commander where I could order, I could spend money, um, uh, and I could request things that I, I needed, and it was basically unlimited. But back to I'm so cognitively overloaded with trying to learn how to do my job, let alone in combat. <laughs> right. That 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 kind of ability to uh, experiment, um, you know, and then ISIS really took that to town uh, in, to, to the Iraqi security forces and the start of Mosul experimenting with, you know, UAS is and there's been a lot on that, you know, experimenting with off the shelf stuff to my problem is well, one, I constrained my urban Christmas list to what I could fit under my Christmas tree. Although a, you know, a, a machine that goes through walls might not fit under everybody's Christmas list. <laughs> I constrained myself to that, but it's this because I had done study and I think this is the army's problem is that they don't have anybody that can commit to studying for a specific environment. Yeah. I was able to just, you know, to actually use history to inform the way somebody else did it to a little bit of experimentation, a little bit of risk, all things that aren't natural as I'm trying to learn my job um, to think of different ways to do it and different tools that I could could use. I mean, I, I, I use the bed sheet as my best Christmas and I, I hate myself for not doing it in combat. I just in, in Aleppo, it came out where they were just stringing bed sheets between buildings so they could cross behind the bed sheet. And the sniper couldn't see him. Yeah. And we had snipers taking people out all the time in Baghdad. And it was a big threat we had in that ability to throw up a bed sheet while I'm standing on the middle of the road never popped into my mind because I'm too overloaded with two other things. You're doing yeah. too busy doing counter sniper and, operations and walking in a lazy W, you know. That's right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and and bed sheets bed sheets are uh, they're a Swiss army knife because in 06 in Fallujah we had our hire sending us these uh, glossy print posters about re recruiting into the Iraqi police and all these things. And we'd put them up and they'd be torn down in half a minute. But we had some, some great army PSYOP guys attached to us. And they, uh, they noticed that messages within the city were spray painted on bed sheets. And if we are going to get a message out and we want it to stay out, we might as well mimic what's going on already within the environment. Yeah. So we start, we started spray painting messages on bed sheets and people wouldn't tear them down because they thought they would belong to a neighbor and that a neighbor might've put <laughs> it up. So I, I love the bed sheets idea. I'm all for giving more bed sheets to, to combat units. I remember one of the biggest lessons I learned, you know, and it's just after talking to thousands of people, but a guy, a guy got, his house was blown up prior to the elections in, in Iraq. And I'm trying to find about about this because this is an important thing. This guy's running for office and kaboom, a bomb goes off. And so I'm really concerned about it. And the Iraqi general who started to call me and my partner, his cultural advisors. Now think about that to have the <laughs> Iraqis go, Hey, I need, I need my cultural people. Where are they at? So that stuff works in both directions. And that was my mark for if I become valuable to them, now I'm something special. Anyhow, back to the story. So we're in the area. This guy gets his house blown up. So I asked this general and I say, what do you think about this? And he's smoking and he waves me off. He's like, Pete, don't, don't worry about that. That's politics. If they wanted him dead, they would have blown him up. And you're just like, oh, shit, I have so much to learn about this area. Like, that's just how they say you need to stop running. I mean, unless you want to die. And here I am worried about this big plot and everything else. And it's just, it just isn't that, that just goes to your thing. You're talking about complexity and adapting John where it's not fair to ask a commander to have that insight. Like if I'm in this area for months and months and months longer, you know, several units and I'm still learning these big lessons, it's, it's impossible to expect a, a a 20 something year old dude who's trying to keep people alive to get this stuff right as a repeatable and reliable thing. So, uh, I guess that means we have to have more of these conversations. Yeah. 
I want so, Google. I really want Google War. That's what I want. Although you know, Google doesn't want to play with the military. I want the ability to. I'm never going to know the question I need to know in these environments, even if it's just not even to understand them, but like to get things done. I want the ability to type in, you know, into Watson. You know, where are the local cranes? Yeah. I don't see why we can't have that. You know, one of the things too that would I would teach units is I would they would send a request in. Hey, how many schools are in this valley? And I would say, yeah. well, who's asking? Oh, it's the partner in in the valley. You know, like it's the, you know Captain Johnson in the valley. He he needs to know how many schools are there. And I'm like, well, I know what the answer is. He should go ask his Afghan partner, his Iraqi partner. Like, go engage them with that question. Quit asking the Americans go engage your partner, you know, but, but it's not what we think about. We think of going to the two shop, the Intel shop to get these things. And it's just, uh, it's counterintuitive to go actually physically ask that person and then say, is that enough? Is that plenty? Are they doing well? Like ask that person what their plan is. That's a, that's a big thing. Anyhow, I, I'm going to extend us into a two hour conversation and I don't want to do that. <laughs> don't get me started <laughs> on the asking those questions. We were asking them in 2003 yeah. and the next guys would come and ask, totally. what are your needs? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I never get told about naming conventions all the time. No, you're spelling Muhammad wrong. And I'm like, I'm not. That's how that dude spells his name. He, he's, right. he's the one that wrote it down. If he spells it Muhammad, then that's how it's spelled. You know, it. <laughs> we don't get to pick. Anyhow, uh, John, will you so, come back and do more with us with this? Oh yeah, I love these conversations. Will, go ahead. I cut you off. Yeah. So I was gonna see if John had ever heard of action research. I think we could do an entire. I know you and Rich already did an episode on action research with partnering, but I. I my current uh, efforts within uh, the Global Cultural Knowledge Network is pushing for action research to be expanded beyond, well, first introduced into the military in a manner that they accept, but expanded beyond partnering and uh, looking at continuity. Because really it is all about enabling someone with a systematic way to adapt and giving them a way to uh, record what they did to adapt that way they can pass it on to somebody else that way when the next guy comes in they can say look these are my lessons learned don't just take my word for it this is what occurred so i was going to ask john if he was familiar with it and if not maybe it's a, another episode that we can all do and just kind of discuss how it might be applicable in multiple spheres within the military i have not but you know i've been in my little bubble at west point studying urban warfare for a while so if you Google action research and the army, the only thing that's going to come up is an article I wrote a while ago. Oh, um, and maybe uh, some stuff by Pete and Rich will pop up too, but basically it's a process. It's got four or six steps, but it tells you how can I influence blank? It comes from education. So teachers have to influence a population that they have zero actual control over. So they got kids or students of whatever age doing their own thing and teachers have to influence what they do. And the only thing a teacher can actually change is their own behavior. And then they can record how their behaviors change the behaviors of the population and just go through that cycle and iteration by iteration, get better at what they do. And to me, We've talked about continuity through throughout this. We've talked about being able to adapt to a situation, and we've talked about doctrine and training. If if a company commander was given this simple process uh, of how to change and adapt systematically and record it, and then hand it off to their uh, their successor, I think that would be powerful. Whether they're looking at combat operations in an urban environment where it's hey we learned that you got to go underground versus uh going through front yards or whether it's information operations or uh civil military operations or psyop it, the ability to uh, have a systematic way to adapt and then pass that knowledge on is critical and i think the army it would behoove them to accept it and, and build off of it. Yeah, I would be more than happy to come back and discuss it and learn more. All right, fellas. No, let's do it. I'm just uh, I'm going through all of John's work. He's written so much stuff, and I feel I felt like I knew before what to talk about, but there's so much more you've done, and I know Will's been busy as well. So, I, I, And I don't know. 
I don't know what the audience thinks of these things, but I know that they're important. And even if nobody right now in the army or the military hears these messages, I, I know that saving these conversations will help somebody along the way. Like you said, Google war is, is going to be made like by folks like us that have been out there long enough to go. That's a great idea at Fort Leavenworth, but here on the ground, uh, it's just not possible. So let's continue the conversation. Let's uh, let's continue to push each other. And, and let me thank you both for your time. I appreciate it. And uh, I know that these shows, again, may, they may not be smash hits. I don't care. I, I think it's important stuff as we try to see what the future is. So thank you very much. Thanks, Pete. Thanks, Will. Yep. Thank you.